Man, my heart has been thinking about this video, and we're going into this sermon series that I try to do once a year, and, and I update it every year, but it's all about how do we help the next generation win? How do we help them have the kind of faith that's going to last once they get out of our house? And I know some of you, I saw some of you at graduation, we had a daughter that graduated and a son graduated eighth grade, and all the festivities and all the stuff, and this stuff is like, man, we are feeling it we are feeling it thinking about i saw some horrifying stat it was like yeah 93 percent of the time you spend with your children are done before they graduate and the rest of your life it's only the next seven percent like oh god what's you know like i was losing it i was losing it but it just shows like you don't have a whole lot of time those of you with little kids man i promise you everybody says it bam it is lightning fast so how do we make sure that when our kids go off to college or whatever's next for them, they have a relationship with Jesus that isn't going to bend and break with the weight of life's challenges? When they go to school and that first professor decides to take it out on, on our students and try to dismantle everything about the Christian faith, now, there's an, an educational idea there that you break the kids down to build them up. I understand that. But how do you make sure that they have a relationship with Jesus that won't break when that is happening? How do you make sure that years later they have a stronger faith than when they did when they were kids? How do you set them on that path? We had a, a, a big funeral here yesterday, a very tragic loss of a, a young mother. And... She, she had a lot of kids, and she had grown up in the church, in, in the youth group here. And filled in the service were all the kids who grew up with her in the youth group in Tower Hill, years and years ago. And somebody pointed out, uh, one of our members pointed out at the end, said, this is what youth ministry is doing. It's creating lifelong relationships, a place where you can gather back and know that you are loved and know that you belong what are we doing to help our next generation? How are we helping them to know and love Jesus and know that we're here for them? So it's a two-parter. We're going to talk today a bit about what's going on in the church. I have some updated information from last time I did this message. And then next week, we're going to look at who is this next generation. And I'm going to try really hard not to embarrass my eighth grader with my knowledge of his slang terms like lit. Anyway, <laughs> yep, it's just as dumb as uh, when I say it. So, we are, uh, how do we help the next generation win? And we have to start with kind of the church, because the church is a big part of this puzzle. Uh, in his book, Missional, Alan Roxborough talks about, he had a friend, marine biologist, who was swimming the Great Barrier Reef, and she came up after diving and she was just beside herself with grief and she said and he's like why are you so upset she said because they're all dying the reef great barrier reef dying all, all the reefs around the world are dying and there's nothing anyone could do about it i and she goes i could keep, keep swimming around as if they're not dying but it doesn't change the fact that in a generation they'll be gone and he says wow that sounds to me like the church in america right now we could keep swimming around like nothing's wrong. And there are a lot of church folks who do. But it's not going to change the fact that in a generation they're gone. What good is our faith if we can't hand it into the next generation? We're always one generation away from extinction. When it comes to handing down the faith in a way that the next generation can receive. And part of it for some of us, like I grew up in a non-Christian house. I didn't have an example of somebody doing that for me. So I had to figure out. And there's no, like, manual. This is how you do it. And every kid's the same. And you do it, you know, at six months old, you start doing this. And, you know, whatever it is. It just doesn't work that way. So you need the church's help to help you figure it out. And that's hopefully what we're here for. But the reason that the reefs are dying, so to speak, is because of the sea change. That's why reefs around the world are dying. That's why the, the church in a lot of places is dying. Because the culture around it changed dramatically. 
Case in point, 1955, Los Angeles Times. This page is a page of the paper dedicated to Presbyterian news only. The LA Times, not exactly the most religiously friendly publication. A whole page of just Presbyterian news. 1955 was maybe a little bit different. Some of you grew up in the church of that era, and you, era, and you remember just how different it was. You went to church because you went to church. And you wear your Sunday best. You better not make too much noise. Culture changed around us. It used to be that Christians had a front seat in culture, in society. Christian ideas, Christian values. The gravitational pull was toward the church. And now, of course, we know it's absolutely the opposite. Uh, Daryl Guter, who is a professor of mine at Princeton, said this, this term in, the church, in America's history is known as Christendom. Think Christian kingdom, right? The influence is toward God, toward the church. He says it's specially designed, uh, designated privileges for the church and society. A dominant culture that bore the deep imprint of Christian values, language, and expectations regarding moral behaviors. We know that just is not the case anymore. In fact, for most, as you go younger generationally, there's less and less attachment to church at all. So just some of the numbers. 2019, they found that 6 in 10 churches in America were declining or in plateau. 6 in 10, 60%. That's not now not even factoring the churches that closed their doors during the pandemic, never reopened them. And, and we don't actually have stats yet on how many of these churches are plateaued or declining now. Also from 2019, 4,500 churches a year closing their doors forever. I have to think that number is up. And then from this year, this just came out a couple weeks ago. 67% of churches are under 100 members and worship less than 50 a week. 67% of churches in America. That's crazy. When you could go into like any big town, throw a rock and hit four churches. But it's like there's no one in them. And that's why I'm so thankful when we talk about the, the problems that churches have. That we have problems like, oh, how are we going to fit more people? How are we going to do more for our youth? These are, the, these are the right kinds of problems to be addressing. But what I hope is, when we talk about this stuff, it lights a fire in you to do something about it. Because this is what our church is about. This is why we're doing this. If we can't do this to help the next generation win, what the heck are we doing? Numbers just from our denomination, these come out every year. The last one for 2022 hasn't come out yet. I'm sure they're not eager. To be like, Here's how bad it is this year. Um, but uh, the last numbers we got within five years, 289,000 members gone in the Presbyterian Church USA. 638 churches closed. In 10 years, 566,000 membership loss. It's actually worse than that. 1983, the denomination PCUSA was formed. There's not been a single year of net growth since 1983. And actually, it's worse than that. The Northern Presbyterian Church and the Southern Presbyterian Church that became the PCUSA, they hadn't had a single year of net growth since the mid-1960s. Not one year. Decline ever since. And we've talked about these numbers a lot, so I'm not going to belabor them. But again, by generation, less and less faith. But there are also some really good numbers that came out literally this last week. Same organization, Barna. They discovered this. This is kind of wild. Considering how bad things are for the church in America, 52% of U.S. teens are very motivated to learn about Jesus. 52%. So teenagers are the most likely to say they're atheists, but the reason they're atheists is because they never met Jesus. They have no idea about the story, about the gospel. They're the most open generation to hearing about Jesus, which is incredible. 76% of Christian, Christian teens, they identify as Christian, 
say that Jesus still matters to them. Seven in ten adults and teenagers in the United States say they have a positive view of Jesus. And 70% of Christian millennials say that their commitment to Jesus is still important. Then you look at what's going on in our culture. We've seen all sorts of Jesus stuff everywhere in the best way possible. We saw the revival at Asbury uh, in other colleges as well. We saw Damar Hamlin, which, you know, he drops on the field. All of a sudden, it's okay to pray publicly. Everybody's praying for Damar. We saw this kind of awakening of like, oh, we need to pray, and it's okay. And even TV personalities weren't beaten up over the fact that they prayed quite publicly for Damar Hamlin. You saw the Jesus Revolution movie that busted everybody's expectations of what it was going to do in the box office. A lot of you have seen that movie. I was just thinking about The Chosen and the success of that. The He Gets Us campaign, Super Bowl ads about Jesus. And then, of course, our experience here at Tower Hill is we're witnessing revival happen. And it's awesome. So here's the question. Why do we keep trending post-Christian as a culture? With all the good news, why? The answer stings. It was the title of the Barna Research Survey, or the article talking about the survey, that said this. Openness to Jesus isn't the problem. The church is. The church is. Why? Because for many churches, we've simply forgotten our mission. We've forgotten what we've been called to do. What are we called to do? Just like in Acts chapter 2, we're to declare the wonders of God in the language of the people. The first gift of the Holy Spirit to the church is what? Divine translation. Not just ethnic language translation, but generational language tra translation. How do we explain it in a way that the next generation will receive and understand? You can't do it the same way you always did it before. It just simply won't work. It won't make sense to them. It's like one of my friends from seminary, Matt, he was in the Salvation Army growing up. And he had to go on a mission as a teenager. He and uh, one other young lady went on this mission together to Germany. They didn't know what they were supposed to do, they just showed up. And this person who was leading them, she said, you're going to go into that bar and you're going to sing a song, a Jesus song. It's a teenage kid. He's like, so what, what song do you know how to play? He goes, I can play Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. Anyone remember, by the way, of the OG, Lord, I Lift Your Name? Yeah, I played that a lot. Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. He's like, do, I don't know any German. It doesn't matter. You're going to go in, you're going to sing it. So he and this girl go in to this German bar, and he's just like, we were in the middle of nowhere. Like, I don't even know what the heck was going on. We go on, and we start singing, because somebody thought this was a good ministry idea. They started singing, Lord, I lift your name on high. And he said that the crowd didn't move. They didn't even look up from their beer. Like, nobody, nothing. Just, and they're singing, you know, in the shakiest hint, Lord, I lift your name on high. I mean, it's just, it's horrifying, right? And at the end, they run out. And he was thinking, like, what the heck did that accomplish? They weren't listening. They didn't care. And then uh, the lady who was kind of with them, shepherding them, said, yeah, some of them don't even speak English. What are we doing? I feel like this is the church when we refuse to change what we're doing to reach the next generation. It's like singing, Lord, I lift your name on high in a German bar. It's just simply not translating. So how do we translate the wonders of God into the language of culture? To the language that we're in. This is the task of the church. It always reminds me of Judges 2.10 where it says, After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. It's just because they don't know. But they're open. They're open. My uh, middle guy, he did confirmation this year. And I remember uh, he had a friend who was doing CCD. He had lots of friends who were doing CCD. And I remember they were, we were given rides or something, and I was taking um, Jason up to the church for youth group. And uh, this kid he was with was just had a lot of questions. He's like, 
oh, you have to go to church? Is that like CCD? And he's like, he's like, no. He's like, it, it's just fun. And he goes, you go to church just for fun? Yeah, it's fun. Like, we play games, we do stuff. And you can see this kid was like wrapping his head. He was questioning everything. He like, had no idea what was going on. And like, how do we help our church be a place, honestly, not just for kids, but for all of us, where there's joy, where there's real connection, yes, where there's fun, where we could grow together and feel like we can be safe to have deep conversations, where we can love each other when things get really hard, when we can celebrate each other when things are really good. How do we do that? It's kind of like um, Todd Bolsinger's book, Canoeing the Mountains. Some of you know this book. We talked about it a few years ago when it came out. Some of you, I think, even did a small group around Canoeing the Mountains. But this was the story of Lewis and Clark in their Corps of Discovery in 1803, where they were tasked with, they had to explore the territory of the Louisiana Purchase. And their number one goal was to find a navigable water route from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. They hired Meriwether Lewis to do this because he was an expert river guide, river navigator. In their heads, this is what they thought. They'd find the headwaters of the Mississippi, and they would literally canoe downstream to the Pacific Ocean. They had no idea that what they hit, here, go on, I already talked about that, next slide. They hit the Rocky Mountains. Oops. River trip over, they had no idea what to do. They had all the wrong equipment. They're literally carrying their canoe and paddles, and they're like, do we, how do we canoe the mountains? We can't. So they had to figure out, what do we do? We have to change. We have to pivot if this mission is going to succeed. It's all about adaptive change. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we got to try. Why? Because the mission is worth it. The mission is worth it. Whenever I think of this, kind of what's going on in culture, and, and how we should go about the work of doing whatever we can to reach people with the message of Jesus, with the good news, is I think about the story of Nehemiah. And uh, we did a series on this about a year ago, but I want to share, talk a little bit about the first chapter of Nehemiah. But first, to get your head around where Nehemiah is, uh, actually my mother and father-in-law are with us in, in worship today, don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you, but um, I was thinking about this because I was thinking about the 2010 Joplin tornado. We, uh, my mother-in-law was literally a block away from the devastation of the Joplin tornado, and we went, it was about a month or so after and I remember just seeing the devastation of Joplin, but the weirdest thing was the trees it didn't have any bark on them. It was this oddest thing. It just ripped. I mean, it was just this powerful, horrible thing. And of course, you had a community that was reeling and trying to figure out, what do we do next? And I often think when we hear about these disasters, it's like they're in the news cycle and then they're gone. But it's like, how would you feel if you, you lost everything? I, I mean, it's like, where do you even begin emotionally, let alone logistically? What sort of things would be kicked up in you, and how long would it take you to get over it? And I think this is a nice way of starting to understand Nehemiah's story, in that the Israelites had been exiled. They had been taken away from Jerusalem for a couple of generations. And Jerusalem, the place where God supposedly lived in the temple had been destroyed, ransacked, burned. And wondering what that would feel like. Not only did we lose our home, we lost the place where God's supposed to dwell. So where's God now? He's not with us. So here we find Nehemiah in the 5th century B.C. And he had a high position in the current Persian government. He was the cupbearer to the king. You know, it's like, so the king doesn't die of the poison. You got the cupbearer who you trust to make sure is going to give him the food and the drink. You've seen that in the movies, I'm sure. Same idea. He had this important position. He was a Jewish man. And 
he, he gets news about the state of Jerusalem and what's going on in it. Here's what happens. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. Is there anyone left? How are they? Have they rebuilt things since it was destroyed? What's the state of it? They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments... Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. What we learn, in, I think, in Nehemiah's reaction is, I think, exactly how we're supposed to be reacting here and now and how we help the next generation win. Because I think there are really important things he goes through that we go through. The first thing is this. The first thing that I think we learn is when our faith is challenged, we don't throw our hands up in the air and give up. We go to our knees and pray up. This is what he did. He heard about how bad things were. He went to his knees and prayed. But then he did something about it. Right? It says he mourned for days. He mourned the state of things. And I think like us, we could mourn the fact that the world is the way that it is. Oh my gosh, there's just something in the paper about like all the presidential candidates. I'm like, oh my gosh, again? Can we just do this? I'm like just waiting for just how ugly it's going to get. I'm like I'm not looking forward to that. It's okay to mourn the way things are. But it's not okay to just act like Nothing has changed. Like the reef is dying, you're just going to keep swimming around and do nothing about it. You've got to do something about it. And that's what he does. That's the other thing we learn when we use everything at our disposal and wherever God has placed us to do his work. And if you've been here for a few years, you know that this is what we've been trying to do. So we just did this capital campaign. We're trying to keep doing this. How do we create great environments for the kids? How do we make sure that we set them up to want to be at church? to love being at church, to know that we're for them, that we're a place where they can be here and feel comforted, they can be themselves, they can learn and grow and be challenged, that they can go on mission trips, they can do all sorts of things. How do we do that well? And you know, the last few years, right, 2015, 16, we changed the attic space for them. Go ahead to the next one. We created large group and small group spaces that are all filling up like crazy. We've got a growing group of teens here. This is what we're supposed to be doing. But I think some of us feel like, okay, that's great. But when it comes to like actually helping out, or I don't know how to talk to my own kids or grandkids. I don't know what to say. I don't know their music. I say dumb things like lit out of context. Like, I don't know, they don't think I'm cool. What do I do? That's when I always think of the greatest evangelist in my life 
Agnes Sales. Agnes led the children's program at the First United Methodist Church of Glendale, California, where my mother ran a preschool. This was the church we joined, and I got baptized, even though it didn't mean anything to me, and I couldn't wait for the minute I could get off stage. It was VBS time, and I did not want to be in VBS. I was probably maybe 13, 14 years old. Didn't want to be in VBS. She obviously knew it. She's like, Jason, I need help this week. I mean, look at her. I wasn't going to say no. She's like, I need help making the snacks for the VBS. I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. And then, like, I'm like, sounds a lot better than being in VBS, right? That week, she didn't try to teach me about Jesus. But, man, did I feel like she really loved me. And she was really thankful that I was helping her. And I got to say, it changed me. It opened me up to God in a way that I wasn't open before. Agnes Sales can do it. So can you. So can you. It's just by loving, loving the next generation and doing, just want to help them win. Hey, I want to help you. What the next generation needs isn't information about Jesus per se. They can get that anywhere. We're in the information overload age. They need interpretation about Jesus. They need someone to show them, this is what it looks like. This is my story. Maybe it could help yours. It's about a formula. Consistency over time equals trust. How do we get the next generation to trust that what we say about God is true and that we're living it in our own lives? That's the other thing. It's not just paying lip service to God. It's like, do I see mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, do I see them actually trying to live faithfully? They're paying attention to that. So if you want to know the biggest thing that you could do is to be as faithful as you can be. You don't have to be perfect. That's why we all need a savior. Just a reminder. But we got to try. It's appropriate and important to mourn what is lost, but then we must get to the work of rebuilding. And just like they said in Joplin, what did they say? After every disaster, we will build back better. We will be a better version of the church than we were all those years ago. If we think the church's best days are behind us, we have, we're the problem. Our best days are ahead of us. A few years uh, after that story about the Great Barrier Reef, I remember reading a story about they went to a reef that had died. They went back and they saw that it had started to regrow. If that's true with reefs, it's even more true for the church. Because God's doing the growing. So brothers and sisters, join me, pray with me, serve with me to help the next gen win. Amen.